Chuck and Brock take a break from examining texts, to reflect upon the aftermath of the recent Supreme Court ruling. This is generous theology. Okay, Chuck, it is an honor and a pleasure to speak with you, as always, and I want to thank you for, for joining us here to talk about these beautiful topics in theology, in philosophy, all things Christendom is something there. And in light of that, it's very difficult to pass by recent events without talking about things and offering our own thoughts and opinions on them in a long form sort of format. And of course, I'm have in mind here the current events regarding the recent overturn of Roe versus Wade, which as we're recording here just happened a few days ago. And so you and I had talked a little bit about it before privately yesterday with our discussion, and we had a chance to maybe talk about it then, but I think both of us thought giving it its own dedicated space could be valuable and also give us a chance to maybe not get caught up in the immediate first to talk about a topic. Now, when people will hear about this, we'll obviously it won't be in the immediate aftermath of the decision. We'll be going through the editing process, and that takes some turnaround. So uh, th things will be a little bit cooler off of this initial reaction, but I still think it's worth us talking about it. It's a fresh, it's a vibrant, it's a game-changing scenario in respect to some aspects of what you and I have colloquially called the culture wars, but I just wanted to, to have a chance to talk with you about that. Uh, my friend, and, and I value your opinion, and I value the thoughts of other folks there. If it's all right, Chuck, I don't mean to just put you on the spot to lead things off here, but did you have any initial thoughts or initial feelings, or how are you processing all the things that have happened here in this in these past few days? Yeah, first of all, obviously, I'm happy about the decision. That is something that I've cared about for a long time. And there's a personal reason behind it as well. My, my middle brother was born in 1970 in Connecticut before abortion was legal in Connecticut and before it was even really available, easily available in, in the New England states. And we know because of later context that had abortion been legal, his birth mother likely would have aborted him uh, and he wouldn't be alive today. And so just that experience of having a brother who could have been a victim but wasn't because of just a time frame certainly has a major impact. And I'm hopeful that this decision will mean that there are more Davids in the world. That's my brother's name. And that they'll live and be a key part of our society. I've also been involved in what I often call the non-traditional pro-life movement. I often think that one of the best ways to get at the real issues that are out there is by finding organizations that, you know, that they may advocate in a certain direction, but maybe they appeal to groups that you wouldn't automatically think of as being, oh, that's a pro-life group. So as an example, even though I am very much a Christian, uh, I have been very much following a, a group called Atheist life. And I do that because there's often this thought of, oh, out, out there, the narrative becomes that people who are anti-abortion, they're just trying to impose their religion on us. If it, why then is this, there this group of atheists who, who are anti-abortion, who are pro-life? And in fact, I've gotten to know a little bit a woman who, she for a long time was involved with Democrats for Life, which is an organization that I've been involved with. And she recently left to join another, to actually found another pro-life organization where she could be a little more, shall we say, radical. She, one of the things she does is she goes in and gets arrested. And, and she's also an atheist. And it's, so let's find out what is your reasoning uh, behind that. Another group that I follow is uh, there's a couple of different feminist organizations that are pro-life, Feminists for Life being one of them. New Wave Feminist is one that I've really followed really closely because a couple of their leaders are just really interesting folks. And looking at the non-traditional pro-life movement, first of all, puts paid to the idea that the pro-life movement is just simply about people who want to control women or they want to impose their 
particular religious views, because these are people who don't fit that narrative by any means. The other thing I like about it is that it gives you an opportunity, I think, to see where the edge is on some of the issues that I think are going to be coming. Because certainly overturning Roe v. Wade is not the end. And if Christians are out there thinking, oh, good, this is the end, it's all over, abortion is done, obviously that's absolutely not the case. There's more that's going to need to be done. And, uh, and looking at some of the issues that those organizations deal with is one way to just sort of figure out where is the edge going to be on some of these issues. And we can talk about some of those things that, in a moment, because I, I think they are things that we're going to have to deal with, whether Christians, non-Christians alike, pro-life people and people who were pro-choice. We're going to have to deal with these issues. And in some ways, taking away the stark edge of the Roe v. Wade decision probably is going to mean there's going to be a lot more discussion in a lot of states about what should be legal and what should not be. And it's go and I think it's going to be much more important for people to think about what is the basis for their pro-life uh, opinions. Why are we pro-life? Why are so many Christians pro-life? Uh, and in what situations is there some validity not to to not to just say, hey, abortion is going to be legal on demand, but are there going to be some situations where it may it may be legal or where the various balancing of the various ethical issues might lead different people to have, including Christians, to have somewhat different decisions about things. And, uh, and that sort of nuance, I think, is going to be important because uh, until Roe v. Wade was overturned, it really did come down to are you pro Roe v. Wade or are you against it? And, and now it's going to be a little more complicated. So I don't, I, I'm interested in your thoughts as well. Just what were you doing when you heard that the news came down and how did you react? So thank you for that, Chuck. I really appreciate how you opened that up. Uh, I'm going to say, first of all, that it seems to be, if there be any cultural Ebenezers, I think about things like the JFK assassination. I think about things like the civil rights movement of the 1960s. I think about things like 9-11. I even think about things like, for example, the contested 2020 uh, presidential election. And I think Roe v. Wade being overturned fits right up in there uh, as the most important, one of the most important cultural milestones of my lifetime. And I rejoice. This was never, there was nothing morally beneficial in my ethical calculus about Roe v. Wade. Now, I understand that's a strong statement to make. It's a strong position to make. And I make it carefully, understanding that this is a controversial issue. And the, the tendency to be willfully misunderstood is one of the chief dangers that I want to avoid. And that's a good reason why I wanted to have a long form conversation, conversational program like you and I are doing right now, where we talk for hours about various topics. One of the things that made it so difficult for aggressive partisans to demagogue Jordan Peterson, for example, was that he had been having these long form conversations in public for years and perhaps almost decades, if you, if you count his teaching. Uh, and the, the lectures that he's released over the years and the visibility that they had gotten. So that when he took, he came to fame for taking his stand in Canada over, I think it was Bill C-16, the use of the pronouns, and he took his stand, one of the things that happened is a certain segment of the culture wanted to portray his stand as being a thoughtless one, as being an aggressive, harmful, and unhelpful, and coming from someone who was not well studied, who was not well considered, and who was just a loose cannon. Think of all of the things, for example, that makes it easy to be upset with President Donald Trump. And so I've noticed a tendency, I've noticed a certain machine apparatus in the culture that whenever anti-leftist positions would come out, this machinery would spring into action and present the person who was opposing the, these leftist positions present them as caricatures, as, as demagogues, and as non-thinkers. And it didn't work in the case of Jordan Peterson because he had such a provenance. He had such a history of smart, reasoned, careful, measured public interaction in the marketplace of ideas. 
And this program, in some sense, is an homage to the effectiveness of that. If someone could take, for example, what I might say on this particular discussion and try to try to make things out in a similar way, then I think I could point to these long-form, respectful, measured, careful, calibrated discussions to really come against that apparatus, which I think is one of the quintessential evils in our modern society, is these organized machines of demagogy. Now, having said that, I rejoice. This was a dark judicial interpretation, and the price that we have paid as a society is an extremely high one. And so there's no but in my analysis. Roe v. Wade has been overturned, but or Oh, and now we should have a long face because there are still issues. There absolutely are still issues. There are absolutely still controversies, and the cultural wars are far from over. One of the things about it that was so beautiful for me is if any judicial ruling has the appearance of being balanced, measured, and fair on this topic, I think the Supreme Court has done it right, has done it well. We have the opinions of the justices. We have the majority opinion. We have the dissenting opinion that they've put their cards on the table. And instead of establishing what the culture's course of action must be by judicial fiat, we actually have the opposite. We have the overturning of such a fiat. And we have the returning of the discussion um, to be worked through the legislative processes through the states. And if you're a constitutionalist, that's exciting to me. I think anybody who is invested in the constitutional system can point to a measured ruling like this and say, yes, the system works. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> and I'm very aware that I'm talking with a very principled one. And so I will rely upon you for that. But at the same point in time, I think we see a measured maturity from this ruling that doesn't solve everything, that doesn't put... Um, everything into nice, neat boxes. But what it does do is it manages to guide the discussion in proper ways that I think every republic is going to have to face if it's going to be successful. And so I'm excited about that. I'm filled with joy about that, over and above the fact that there will now be children born in the land that would not have. And so that's an opening salvo there. I think I've unleashed maybe a little bit of Pandora's box. None of these issues, of course, are unique to me, so I'm not feeling particularly guilty here, Chuck. But when you think about the Pandora's box of issues that are unleashed by latest developments, what are some of the things that strike you the most as being essential themes or themes to watch and follow as this might unfold and develop? Yeah, there's a number of interesting potential developments that I have not had a chance to carefully read through the decision or the concurrence or the dissent, or I don't know if there's more than one. I do know that Justice Thomas, for example, wrote a concurrence, which goes quite a bit further than the original opinion, the majority opinion does, in talking a little bit about court jurisprudence when it comes to how the 14th Amendment applies to various potential rights. And I don't want to comment too much on it because since I haven't read Justice Thomas's opinion, it wouldn't really be fair to do that. I do appreciate, though, that I think the majority opinion did try to be a little more judicious in dealing with that. Because I think there is a sense in which that, that, that you have this concept of a right to privacy. And you can one way to look at that is to say, hey, look, there nobody nobody ever talked about a right to privacy in 1789 when the Constitution first passed and the Bill of Rights came out, so it must not exist. And that potentially can have all sorts of impacts even far away from the life issue that we're going to have to think about. There is also another way to look at it, I think, which is that rather than being strict originalists, we can be principled constitutionalists, that w which would say, yes, there is such a thing as a living document in that we apply this constitution, this document that is the core of our law and uh, of the land. We need to apply it in ways that make sense for the current 
day and age. In doing that, we can't forget the uh, initial context, but we don't necessarily want to get tied into if it was the rule in 1789, that's the way it's going to be forever and ever. And in fact, I, there's, there was recently a quote that I read, I forget from which one of the uh, original drafters of the Constitution, but one of them, who oh, I, it might not have been a drafter, it might have been, might have been actually from George Washington, who said, hey, we who were at the beginning, we shouldn't be seen as gods. We should be seen as men who did the best that we possibly could and created a good system. And so if we go that way, then we have to start thinking about, okay, then how then do we determine what the law of the land today is, what has changed since 1789, that might make the spirit of the law, of the Constitution, uh, look differently than if you just apply a really strict originalist position. And, and those are really interesting questions. Uh, I, I tend to probably drive certain constitutional scholars nuts because I tend to probably not fall too strongly on one side or the other. I'm, I'm not a Scalia Thomas style strict originalist, but, but it also concerns me that we can go way too far and just start talking about living documents. And in the end, they're really meaningless because it's whatever we want it to mean. And I don't think we can do that either. Those are issues that are really going to come out in, in, in our jurisprudence and, and in how we think about how our certain issues going to go. I think another thing that concerns me, I'm just, obviously I think this was a right decision because I think Roe v. Wade was the wrong decision in 1973. It was decided wrong. And we do have a history of overturning wrong decisions long after the fact. Think of Brown v. Board of Education, which took even longer to overturn some really bad precedent. But we do also, I think, have to think about to what extent when we overturn long-held precedent, how do we do that? What's the proper way to do that? How do we, is there a sense in which there is a level of justice in being able to anticipate what the law is? Now, I will say that, for example, on the life issue, on, on, on the abortion issue specifically, in Roe v. Wade, I've heard a lot of discussions about how, oh, people planned their life around thinking Roe v. Wade would be there forever, and now it's not, and it's going to ruin people's lives, and they can't count on, they, they counted on the law, and now, now they can't count on it. I'm not sure that's a super strong argument in this particular case, because people still have the opportunity to plan their families using methods other than abortion. Contraception is perfectly legal. There, there's all sorts of other things that, that people can do that we're not going to suddenly go back to the Middle Ages or whatever, where it was just, okay, you timed it wrong, too bad. So I don't know that you can make that case in a way that I think, for example, in a lot of the commercial cases, the business cases, there is a real concern when you overturn precedent, even when it's bad precedent, that you have to do it really super carefully because of that reliance interest that people have had on the law. I just don't see that there. But it is one thing that is worth thinking of. And then the other thing I think that's really out there and may be, in the end, the core issue that state legislators especially are going to have to think about is what happens when you have a real interest in, that you have multiple interests that are real, that are strong, and then go against each other. So uh, as an example, at what point does the life and safety of a mother take precedence over the life and safety of the child? And at what point does the law need to step in in making that decision? And those might be two different answers. There, there might be in certain places, and you hear about these situations, right, where a mother says, it doesn't matter. I'm willing to give myself up. I'm willing to die just so that this child can be born. It's just for the chance for this child to be born. And the doctors will say, yeah, but the chances that the child's going to make it are so low and you're likely to die because of it. And the mother says, oh, I'm still going to do it. And, and you sometimes hear these stories where it all turns out well in the end. But if, we're, but if we're honest, there are a lot of situations where that people aren't willing to be that sacrificial. And there probably does have to come a time when there is probably a gray area that maybe it's not the job of the state to step in to make those decisions. But where does that end? At what point is it the role of the state to step in and say, now the interest 
in the life of the child or even potentially the other way around, the life of the mother, is so compelling that we're not going to allow you to make certain types of decisions. And those are tough. Those are tough. Uh, and what do you do in a circumstance like that? And is there room for, the, for perhaps that decision to be made by parents and their doctors without the state stepping in and saying, we're going to not allow you to make that decision? And where does that line get drawn? And let's be honest, that is an incredibly difficult decision. And I think we see how difficult that decision is when we look at some of the history that, you know, after Roe v. Wade that led to a decision last week, where there were a lot of cases about what about what about fetal viability, but what happens when fetal viability becomes earlier and earlier? And what about these other factors that play a role? Those are difficult things to deal with. And drawing simple lines is not always so easy. I think another one that we're going to have to deal with, and I know that there are varying opinions on this among Christians, is what about a situation where the pregnancy is a result of rape or where it's a result of incest? I can understand those who would say, hey, let's not let evil, one evil lead to a second evil. I, I understand that. I think I also understand the, the argument that, but in some of these situations, the danger to the mother is, the psychological danger to the mother is so high that maybe there is a role for a decision like that to be made by the mother and not necessarily for the state to be stepping in. And so exceptions like that may be warranted. And those are going to be very difficult conversations to have uh, because you're also, going to, you're also going to be able to point to situations. My brother, as I mentioned at the beginning, my brother was a, a product of rape. And if there were to be a rape exception, perhaps he would, have, he would not have lived. Now, it was, wasn't the, the scary rapist, unknown person type of story. So it's a little more nuanced than that. But I get that the, even as I told my brother's story, I thought about uh, there are people for whom perhaps even that story would cause issues and psychological issues. It didn't for his birth mother for various reasons. But, but yeah, th those are really difficult questions to deal with. And we're going to have to think deeply about them and get beyond even just the stories uh, that can be told because, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. And we as Christians have to be ready to think about what is our basis for making these, making these decisions in these harder cases. It's pretty easy as a Christian to say, hey, a child, a, a baby ha has the image of God and therefore has the right to life. That's the easy part. The difficult part comes when what happens when you've got two very strong cases that are opposite each other, a case for the life of a mother, a case for the life of a child. And when, at what point does those clashing interests, where do we start making the call that we have to step in and make that call on behalf of somebody? Yeah, I, I feel like I'm starting to repeat myself, but I think I do that a little bit because I think it is, it is a difficult it, these are difficult circumstances that, that we're going to have to deal with grace and a lot of prayer. And I think also a lot of a lot of empathy, a lot of understanding that not everybody has the same lived experience as we do, that, that there's going to be a wide variety of that. And so therefore, we have to make the decision on something more than just simply, I feel this way, therefore it should be. Thank you for that, Chuck. I want to say I'm in full agreement because these are some of the situations that make the human condition such a mystery, such an enigma, such a deep situation. We find ourselves in deep waters, and yet at the same point in time, we are not without counsel. We are not without some uh, degree of cultural frame points that I believe can be a blessing here. Now, it is said sometimes that the good is the enemy of the perfect, and if you and I hold a long-form conversation where we really dive into the depth of all the issues of the human condition and all the things that make life difficult for fathers and mothers in this world. I don't pretend to have hope that you and I will come up. Even if we had several years to discuss all of the issues out, I don't think we would come up with the perfect solution. However, I believe that we can come up with very good starting points. We can go out into the deep waters 
not guaranteed of success in every situation or in every endeavor, and yet we can be trained to sail these depths of the human condition. And I think one of the things that I'm most concerned about that I see in the differences between, quote unquote, the two sides, is I believe I see a maturity on the pro-life side that I find very lacking often on the pro-choice side. And I don't make this statement to inflame. I don't make it to just be heuristic and cause an argument. But I think we have to go back to the fact that the sex act is always procreative. It is never simply recreational. And there are consequences, procreative consequences, for engaging in reproductive activity. It seems so obvious. It almost seems like it perhaps ought not need to be said, but yet I find it is need needed. I've talked with many people on the pro-choice side who clearly have a disconnect on this very point. There is an idea that abortion is quote unquote necessary because the expression of sexuality requires that it be available to keep women primarily away from dangerous consequences of sexual activity, that is to say pregnancy. Hold on there. I want to recognize principled opposition where it exists, but I don't want to put it where I don't think it is. This is never going to be a recreational discussion. We're never going to talk about consequence-free sexual activity and expression. And to the folks who want to lay the framework of the discussion in that regard, I have no good news. And so what does that mean? I'm very, I ask people sometimes, especially non-believers, when we talk about religion and the existence of God, I'll ask them, I'll say, who has your best interests at heart? And when I first started asking the question, I expected non-religious people to say things like, well, I do, of course. I have my best interests at heart. And what I found is some people said that. Some non-believers said, you know, I have my best interests at heart. I am the ultimate arbiter of what's good for me, things like that. But what I was very surprised to find was that how relatively rare that response was. And many people paused and found it difficult to answer that question. Sometimes people would say, my mother has my best interests at heart, even more than I do, or my father, or some beloved relative, or some friend. My, my best friend has my interests at heart even more than I do. And I thought to myself, if we're not in a position where we have confidence that our own best interests are in our own hearts, then I think we have to be careful in our ethical calculus. We have to be careful when we're thinking about what's good or bad in a moment. If you, I was in jail ministry for several years, and sometimes inmates would come to me privately and just talk one-on-one -on -one with me. And I never, of course, solicited their stories or details about their case, and I never divulged them. But sometimes inmates would want to talk to me about their life and where things had come from, and they would describe their case to me, and things would unfold and develop in their telling of their story. And maybe about two-thirds of the way through their case, I would ask them, I would say, stop right here. You've said to me that you started down this path and that you took these steps. Just where did you think these steps were going to take you? If, you? if it was a story about theft and the person was telling me about how they were caught up in that lifestyle, I would ask them, what did you think was eventually going to happen here? And usually they would look down, find it very difficult to answer. And it was very obvious that the answer was they thought they were going to get away with it. They thought the consequences were not real or would not affect them or would not impact them. And then I said to them in the brightest tone I could, what do you think now? And my intent was not to make them feel shame. My intent was to make them feel like they're in a situation now where they can face what they're up against with courage, face it square. And that's what I would do with somebody who is in quote unquote difficulty. Growing up, we had a euphemism when I was little. Roe v. Wade became law when I was very young. And so I've never known a world without it before the recent ruling. And when I was young, people wouldn't talk about teen pregnancy or young pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies. They would talk about a woman 
being in quote unquote difficulty. And I thought, okay, I, I, that's significant to me. But what I've come to find about the abortion issue is that as difficult as it is for the woman, it's a life or death matter for the child in the womb. And I think until both sides can chew on that in the same room together and maturely talk about those things, I think, I think we're in for, an, in for a cultural struggle. I think we have two sides that are not going to be able to find ways to continue in a Republican fashion with regard to the Republic. That was one of the things that was so concerning to me about Roe v. Wade was this idea of legislating morality from the bench, from the judicial bench. And I was, I've wondered my whole life, I've been like, how can this constitutional republic survive that? And, I, and for, it's, been, it's happened for so many years that I thought uh, it wouldn't. And I really thought that, quote unquote, the other side would get away with it. I was just watching one, one video in response where somebody said, the questioner asked, a pro-choice person, why do you think you should have a constitutional right to an abortion? Where is it in the Constitution? And the response from the pro-choice person was, I don't care. Sweetheart, you better care. This is not a negotiable. We are in this together to the degree that this document binds us together. And if, Chuck, if you threw out the Constitution over an issue that was really important to you, and she threw out the Constitution, over an issue that was really important to her, and I did the same for an issue that was important to me, and we all lived together non-constitutionally, it's not the least bit clear that's an improvement. So I think that to me is one of the most important points that's been rattling around in this brain as I think about the days after these events. How does that strike you, and where would you push on that back or pull, or what direction would you take that in? First of all, I would agree with you that it is important that courts deal with these issues based on the law and not merely on you know, what, what a particular judge thinks the law should be or another place where I've seen some articles saying this decision goes against the majority view of the people. The courts aren't there to protect the majority view. In fact, to some extent, the way that we've set up the courts is that legislators make majority decisions and courts protect minority rights in, in making sure that the legislative doesn't run roughshod over, over those rights. And so the fact that it may well be that a majority of Americans do not want, did not want Roe v. Wade to be overturned, that might be true. But these decisions can't be made on that basis. They have to be made on the basis of the law. Now, I will say that there are, I think one of the things that we have to be careful to do as well is at the same time that we throw out sort of arguments that are specious in that way, the, the I don't care what the Constitution says, it just should be this. We also do, I think, have to be careful to acknowledge where there might be a basis for a constitutional view different than ours and think about how do we argue those cases. And where there are valid arguments to be made, how do we, in the end, make those decisions? And I am, I will say, I am a little concerned that we have become, in many ways, so partisan, so divided in a partisan way, rather than just simply, uh, we've always had some level of division, in this, but it hasn't always been necessarily so much in a partisan. And it's interesting that, so for example, we had Justice Souter, who was appointed by a Republican. We, we had years ago, Justice Warren, who often is seen as expanding the rights of the accused and, and things like that in ways that were accused of often hurting law and order. And he, of course, had, had been a Republican. And it went the other way as well. There were Democrats who were more conservative. It does seem like we've moved into a place, and we may not stay there. I don't know. It, a lot of these things really are best seen from a much greater distance than we may be able to do in our limited lives. But it does concern me that it seems that some of these decisions are being made more on party line rather than on, shall we say, whether it's conservative or liberal or whether it's more generally judicial philosophy. And it's amazing to me how more and more judicial philosophy seems to be more a function of 
this is the political party that's got you in, and that, so that's what you're going to, to follow. And it hasn't always been that way. And in fact, even in recent years, it hasn't been that way. I think I remember doing a legal update for my local police department. We talked about Arizona v. Gantt, which is a case where it has to do with when police can search a vehicle incident to arrest. And in that case, Scalia and Thomas actually took a, a position with that they were in the majority with what was otherwise considered the liberal wing of the court because of because they took a very principled view of the case. And a number of the police officers who I, I spoke to were rather upset because they just assumed, oh, Justice Scalia, conservative, he must be pro-law enforcement. And I'm like, yeah, but let's talk about this decision. Let's read his uh, let's read his reasoning and let's see where you might go. And then I had the brave officer who is now a, a sergeant in the back of the room who said, hey, actually, he's more consistent. And by the way, I think he was right. So the room kind of looks at him and suddenly he's the villain. I'm concerned that those kinds of stories don't happen as well. And, and I'm not sure why it is, because there is some validity that there are different judicial philosophies, but I don't know. It, it bothers me. Now, it could be that this is all just the days we're in and it's just the cases we're in. And there is some there was some discussion out there that maybe John Roberts is a guy that understands some of this. And even though he, his judicial philosophy tends to be somewhat more conservative, as we often use that terminology, but he also understands some of the other issues with how, with how a court needs to consider changes that maybe, maybe he isn't so tied up into those things. I don't know. I also, by the way, even though my politics tend more towards the Democratic side of the aisle than the Republican side of the aisle. I also thought Amy Coney Barrett and some of her comments that she made in her when she was put before the Senate, I thought she did a nice job in answering some of these things. And frankly, it probably would have gotten me primary, but if I were a Democratic senator, I would have voted for Amy Coney. <laughs> and right, I might be facing a primary right now as a result, which is also unfortunate because that's not the way that it's always been. There, there was a time when there was an appreciation that we needed a little bit of a balance on the court. We needed to really get the best and the brightest on the court and not necessarily just the, the people who are going to fit certain litmus tests. And both sides do it. I'm not, and I'm, I'm not accusing one side or the other because, because both sides do it and both sides have added to it. That's one reason why for a while I tried to go third party. <laughs> it was just out of, out of the frustration that I had. And so to tie it all together, then, one thing that I would hope that Christians do is to think very carefully when they deal with the various political issues that are going to come up related to life, related to things that, that are going to come up now that Roe v. Wade's been overturned, but also on all sorts of other issues, is to think Christianly about all of their the positions that they're taking. And don't necessarily assume that uh, one political side or the other is always going to have it. Because I think if we're too, frankly, if we're too tied, and it can happen either way, if we're too tied with one party or the other, I don't know if that's Christian anymore. I think suddenly we've made an idol out of our politics. And uh, we've got to be careful not to do that. And uh, yeah, and, and, th th and then to tie it back to the beginning then, this is why one of the things that I like to do even outside of the abortion arena is to start looking for quote unquote strange bedfellows. And why, why are those strange bedfellows there? Are there some things that we haven't always considered because we make certain political assumptions? Why are there pro-life atheists, for example, or or why are there African Americans that are focused on mar market economy type of things? Just things that, that that don't always seem to follow our presumptions about the way and our prejudices about the way uh, things ought to be. And one way to fight that is to actually look where look specifically for where those presumptions and prejudices seem to be challenged. And even if it doesn't change one's decision one's ideas about things, I think that exercise of considering those things and looking a little bit more deeply and being willing to be challenged and then from that challenge going deep into what it what really what is the Christian worldview, how is that going to speak to this issue? Understanding that there's not always going to be unanimity, because scripture isn't simply just a set of legislation about how 21st century America ought to run things. 
And so there's even going to be some differences among Christians on this. But but we have to take seriously our our presuppositions and our ideas as Christians as we make these kinds of decisions and can't just farm them out to others to make those decisions for us because we like the way they think about one thing or the other, and so they must be right. My friend, this has been, we've had a chance to talk about something controversial in a measured and careful sense. And I thank you for that, and I appreciate that. I think one of the passages, I looked to the scriptures to try to encapsulate what I hoped would be divine wisdom on the topic. And I don't believe it's particularly hard to find godly counsel about reproductive issues, God's expectations for us reproducing on the earth that he has created and he has put us in. And I don't, I think all of the standard texts have been talked about so that people who are interested in what I would say would be the divine counsel really have a rich riches to bring up and to look at. There was one passage that's rarely cited that I think presents a tonal vignette, (laughs) tonal meaning as in tone, such as it gives a word picture of a thing, and uh, it has some bite to it. It comes in the form of a divine rebuke, and yet it comes from the God who loves sinners so much that he sent his own son. And so if I could have a measured discussion with principled actors on both sides. I think the passage that I would want to bring up would be a Job chapter 39. And let me just do that real quickly here. Job 39, I would desire that everybody in the Republic consider this paragraph. And I'm thinking about verses 13 through 17, which I will read here now. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly, as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. So in this passage, we hear God thinking about his creative handiwork in the ostrich, and he speaks of how he has created her and how thoughtless she is with regard to her own reproductive issues. And there's a verdict there. Now, are ostriches people? No. But I think we have a picture. We have a bird running loose and free, coming here and going there, reproductively speaking. And I think we could ask ourselves as humans, are we unmindful with our young? Do we treat our young harshly as if they were not ours? Do we not care about the reproductive aspects of this issue? If so, how do we avoid the verdict that God gave to the ostrich when he says God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense? Now, this could obviously be me pointing the bony finger of condemnation. I just mean it to lift us up, to call us to be better, than the ostrich. I think we see a warrant for that in the scriptures. And I think that God has given us the faculties and capacities for something more than that. And you talked about your brother, and you talked about other women who have made great sacrifices up to and even including their own lives in some cases, sacrifices for their children. And I think we see throughout the scriptures that God honors parents, and God has a high esteem for them. And I think that has to inform us when we're considering these things. And if we want to recognize gray areas, I think that's fair. But there are lots of, there are lots of things that are not particularly gray. And I think we have to have the courage to recognize those as well. And I hope that we will. And of course, Chuck, as you said earlier, and as I've heard from so many messages from the pulpit regarding this issue, the battle, quote unquote, has not concluded. We've in fact only just entered a new phase a new national discussion, a new national negotiation. And I hope and pray for godliness to come from it. And I think that that we as believers really do bring something valuable to the table that I hope gets brought in a positive way, that I hope isn't just excluded from the Overton window, that is not just, as you point out, not just one party's view. And so 
I'm excited. I'm looking forward to the next phase of discussions. We hear talk about a great reset in the culture. And I'm sure that this one decision is perhaps as close as anything that I've experienced so far in my life, except maybe perhaps 9-11, maybe perhaps the 2020 election. But this is perhaps the most significant great reset in national dialogue and discussion that's happened in my lifetime. So in that sense, I'm excited. I'm looking forward for the next phase and also prayerfully excited about it. So can I throw it over to you maybe for some last thoughts? Yeah, I haven't heard as much of the discussion about a great reset. I do think, though, that it is an opportunity to engage and for Christians to engage in the public sphere in a way that is winsome. And I hope we'll take advantage of that. And I hope that, uh, frankly, I think there's even some room for on some of these issues where we come really close to the edge of where should the lines be, where the state jumps in or it doesn't, those kinds of things. I, I hope that there's even the, the opportunity for debate among Christians, because I think there is a sense that when it's done well, iron sharpens iron. And, and at, additionally, if it's done well, hopefully we, we would expose the real deep issues that need to be discussed in, in, in our culture and in our, in our communities in a way that gets people to think deeply about them. And when we too easily just simply divide into two camps, it makes it much harder to engage in those nuanced discussions. Those nuanced discussions are things that we try to do regularly, as you mentioned, with our long-form discussions. And we do try to deal with some nuance and talk about those areas where, you know, where it, there may even be some difference of thinking among Christians of good good Christians who who agree on key issues, but there are, there are areas of disagreement. And, and But I hope that maybe this is an opportunity for even more of that to happen among all sorts of folks. And, and if it does, I think that would be a good thing, because I think we as Christians also need to make sure that the basis for why we think certain ways about things is also clear and, and also makes it out there. We're not the majority of Christians aren't pro-life because they because they're one political party or the other, or because some politician told them to think that way, or or even because somehow it says in the Bible, "Thou shalt never abort your child," because it doesn't exactly say that. We're pro-life, majority anyway of Christians are pro-life because as we look at the image of God and how it's presented in human beings, we have a high extremely high value that we place on human life. In fact, the value we place on human life is one of the highest values that we as Christians can possibly have. And I think we need to, that needs to be out there even more than it is. And then we need to show how that, that high value that we place on life expresses it in other ways as well. I think we do have that opportunity. So I'm hopeful that this will lead to more opportunities like that. Thank you.